called to order January 25th, 2021 City Council meeting of Waynesboro. Uh, a few things I want to cover before we start the meeting. The first is citizens may participate in our public hearing and citizen comment period at the appropriate time. Then we're meeting on Zoom. You'll have to call in and be part of a uh, virtual meeting. So the call in number is 844 844 9200. You will here enter your access code. At that time, you'll enter the number 398145, followed by the pound sign. You will hear the uh, recording say question session has started. At that time, you'll press star, followed by the number six. You would, uh, you'll hear, you'll be, if you'd like to speak, press the number one. At that time, press the number one and you'll be added into a room where you'll hear an audio feed of the meeting. Please wait until the moderator uh, comes on and tells you you can share your comments with the council. At that time, you may present your, uh, your information for us for the public hearing. All right. With that, let's move on to item number two. Item number two is to adopt the uh, meeting agenda tonight. Is there a motion to adopt the meeting agenda as presented? I'll make that motion. Thank you, uh, Mr. Allen. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Thank you, Dr. Hostetter. Uh, any discussion? All in favor say aye and show your hand. Aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you all. Item number three is to consider the consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll make that motion. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Is there a second? A second. Thank you, uh, Mr. Short. Any discussion? All in favor say aye with a hand sign. Aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries 5-0. Thank you all. Our next item is matters from mayor. I've only got one thing that I'd like to bring up tonight, and that uh, involves one of our police officers. Uh, I would like to congratulate Becky Meeks, uh, Captain Becky Meeks, I'm sorry, Captain Becky Meeks of Waynesboro Police Department for being awarded the 2020 Lambert Radcliffe Trainer of the Year Award. Captain Meeks is a member and leader of our crisis intervention team, and she's been on the team since 2009. Uh, Captain Meeks and two other police officers formed that team in 2009. One year after becoming uh, a member of the team, she became their first instructor. Since then, the program has uh, conducted 37 basic CIT, which is a crisis intervention team uh, training sessions, and had trail, uh, 12 train the trainers under uh, Captain Meeks' leadership. Uh, this award was presented by the New River Valley Crisis Intervention and New River Valley uh, Community Service Boards. So it's, it's quite a, a nice award to, to get for our police officer, our police captain. And uh, it, uh, I just want to thank Becky, and I know the rest of the council would like to thank Becky for her dedication, uh, not only to our citizens in our city, but the Commonwealth and other departments around the state. Thank you, Becky. Um, with that, that's all I have for tonight. Does any other member of council have something they would w wish to bring out? <laughs> Dr. Hofstetter is waiting, waiting to give his report. I can see it. I, I am. Um, uh, you know, th this time it's uh, a, a, an enthusiastic and optimistic uh, notation that the Central Sh uh, Shenandoah Health District is moving into phase 1B in terms of vaccination availability. Um, and that includes folks 75 and older. Um, they are starting to give those vaccines out at Augusta Health, but is, as I understand it, overseen by the health department. Um, there is a website, uh, and I have it here, so let me get you the, the information. We'll try to get it posted to it. may already be on our website. Um, the Central Shenandoah, so it's CSDH, Central Shenandoah, uh, HD rather, Health Department um, at VDH. Um, so it uh, will lead you to information about getting signed up to get on the list. Now, it is not a direct line to the list 
to get a, a time or anything pre-vaccination, but it's the first stage. So I encourage people to start to look into that, have somebody who's internet savvy help you get on there and get your name uh, sort of on the queue. Um, they haven't gotten many of them out yet. You know, they're rubbing it up. So hopefully within a few days, we'll hear more about lots of people getting on the list and getting their vaccines. But that is a, a great development, I think, locally. Thank you, Dr. Hossetter. Anyone else have anything they'd like to share tonight? All right. Let's move on to item number six then. Item number six is to hold a public hearing and receive uh, and receive comment uh, on the request of Riverbend Development Development applicant on behalf of Rosser Avenue Development LLC for a preliminary subdivision plat for a hundred or 220 acre lot residential subdivision on 70.68 acres track at zero Tiffany Drive. Uh, Waynesboro tax map 4-3-112. Following the public hearing, the council will consider introducing an ordinance approving the preliminary subdivision plat. Mr. Jude. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Uh, you should be fairly familiar with this project, this subdivision. We had a rezoning not that long ago, I believe back in August, that, uh, uh, at which this was approved. Now, at the rezoning, I told you that you, we did not have to address the details of the layout, but that we did have to address whether or not this would happen, because that was sort of the moment to, what the city had full discretion. We're now in the opposite situation. You don't have much discretion. You've already approved the rezoning, so they have the right to a subdivision here of this magnitude. However, uh, we can talk about the details of the development um, at this stage. There is an attached text amendment which goes along with this subdivision. So if it's all right with the council, I'll present both of those items, um, but we, they were advertised separately. So you'll have to hold two public hearings and one is not dependent on the other. You may remember the location of the property is just behind the Grand Home Furnishings and Martins and Walmart down in the southwest part of the city near exit 94. It's a large property. Again, it's our largest infill development opportunity. And it lies in sort of the middle of the triangle between Ludewitt Boulevard, West Main Street, and Rosser Avenue. The rezoning was approved in August of 2020 with a number of proffers. One was a conceptual site plan that the subdivision had to be in general conformance with. Another was a pocket park of at least 30,000 square feet that would be owned and maintained by the Homeowners Association. There were quite a few traffic improvements and there was a large traffic impact analysis that was done as part of the rezoning. And there was construction of a multi-use path along the main road and then some land to be available to the city for future recreational purposes. Uh, just to address each of those, their conceptual site plan staff does feel that the subdivision plat roughly matches it with some changes for topography and you know stormwater engineering and that type of thing. They provided the pocket park as shown on the original uh, plat. They will be uh, doing the traffic improvements as required. Um, also the traffic study was based on a max build out of 600 uh, residential units. They're only proposing a subdivision with 208 units um, and it'll leave some space for probably close to 200 multifamily units, uh, fewer than that in the future. So the max build out that they're going to get at the end of this uh, is only is going to be less than 400 units probably. Um, so they'll be well below the numbers that we saw on the TIA. And then the construction of the multi-use path, you'll see that uh, when I show the plat. Uh, the land uh, will not, the part that they're subdividing isn't in the area where that uh, land that they designated for future recreational purposes is. Um, and as part of the proffers, uh, we maintain that they or the homeowners association would have to continue to own and maintain that property until the city and unless the city requested which we have not the subdivision has been renamed creekwood village it's a by right subdivision with no waivers requested that means that we have to approve it if it conforms to the zoning and subdivision ordinances the roads differ just slightly from the original site plan because of terrain um, but it still includes all the necessary connections that we discussed in the rezoning process um, and the roads will uh, uh, comply with the city's subdivision ordinance with VDOT standards and with the uh, Virginia fire code. We have a multi-use path that will be built on one side of their main road through the subdivision 
um, in lieu of sidewalks on both sides, and that should be eight feet wide. Um, and they've provided on the side with the pocket park. So actually, I think will be quite a nice path. will be consistent uh, through that area. The subdivision will, rec will create 208 residential lots with a mix of housing types. Um, originally in the zoning plan that you saw, it was all single family attached to so sort of duplex type houses. They've lowered the number of those and instead they'll be including 62 single family detached lots as well as 36 townhouse lots. So it'll be a pretty nice mix of housing. I think it will create for a better, um, better mix of options for people that are buying in this neighborhood. Um, you can see examples. This is what the townhouses would look like. Could be in sort of blocks of six or so. And this is what your single family attached looks like. Two units attached in the middle and then single family home lots. You can see they'll all be fairly close together mixed in. Now for the proposed zoning text amendment, the applicant has requested a, an amendment to the zoning ordinance 98.5.1.5. Uh, this deals with access standards and parking. It states that for single family detached, single family attached, zero lot line houses, two family duplexes and corner lot duplexes, the maximum width of impervious vehicular travelways, basically driveways, and parking areas located within the required front yard setback shall not exceed 25% of the lot width. Basically, your driveway can't be more than a quarter of the width of your lot. This makes a lot of sense for most of those housing types. Um, for all of the housing types that were listed there, with the exception of single family attached, uh, they need at least a 50 foot wide lot. So 25% of 50 feet, 12.5 feet, that's plenty wide enough for a driveway. Uh, so it makes perfect sense. However, like townhouses, which are not included in that list, single family attached houses are meant to be built on narrower lots. In fact, we allow them on lots as narrow as 25 feet. Unlike townhouses, um, they are subject to the driveway width limitation. 25% uh, of the width of these lots is less than the width of a typical um, car, or much less a, a driveway. Um, and so in order to provide a driveway, um, they would have to widen the lots and you know, quite a bit. Uh, that our ordinance doesn't, in a way our ordinance doesn't require them to, um, or get rid of the driveways. This it seems like a problem to us on staff because the code requires them to provide off-street parking, um, and we don't allow for construction of alleys that would allow them to put parking in the rear. Um, so they need to provide parking spaces off-street. Uh, so somehow they've got to build driveways, and uh, if those driveways can't be as wide as a car, then um, or as wide as a, a lane, then that's an issue. So the proposed amendment is just for single family attached, just for this type, this housing type, which is two units attached to each other, um, to add a minimum allowable driveway width for narrower lots. Um, but 25% of the lot width does not allow for a single car driveway. The applicant has requested uh, a minimum width of 12 feet. So that would correspond roughly to the minimum width that you could get um, in your standard 50 foot wide lot and would allow them, that's the same as an interstate travel lane, would allow you to have a nice comfortable driveway for one car. Um, the applicant, in our opinion, has satisfied all sections of the zoning and subdivision ordinance and therefore staff recommends approval. The Planning Commission also recommends approval of the subdivision on a 6-0 vote. Um, staff also recommends approval of the text amendment and Planning Commission does as well. Uh, again, just as a reminder, you'll have to hold separate public hearings for the text amendment and the subdivision plat. I'm going to pull up in just a second here the, uh, the plat as it currently exists. Um, put that up while we um, discuss it. Are there any questions for me? We have the applicants here as well, and I'll get them to turn on their cameras in a moment. Anyone have any questions for Mr. Juday? Luke, I just have a question about the uh, the eight foot shared use path. What was the what was the decision point behind going to that standard, which is a deviation from uh, a standard AASHTO with um, I believe eight foot does comply with Ashto, or at least that's what we allow if you get rid of sidewalks on both sides. Um, eight, eight, eight foot is is uh, a minimum, at least for, for B, the VDOT standard is that it's eight foot minimum if you can provide justification for it. And so that typically is that is, uh, as an example, like the Augusta County uh, shared use path off of exit 91, mm -hmm. we did an eight foot path, and the reason for that was because of um, it's largely serving remote or disconnected, disjointed, developing, emerging areas. Mm -hmm. 
sort of the justification for that reduction to eight foot minimum. Um, I don't know that we, I don't think we required a justification from them specifically, but I know it was pretty difficult for them to fit the path into the right of way. Um, so that's probably what the applicant would say if we can on this well. And I, I'm fairly sure this is eight feet. Actually, I need to. I, I think it was eight feet. I think I read it. In the yeah, actually, was eight feet. That's how I was just. Ask. I mean, I, I think it'll be fine. I, my my only sort of tension point with that is that it's at the at the the, the totality of the development. Once mm -hmm. the whole thing gets built out, um, and if it's as you know, as much of a uh, of a neighborhood as it is a subdivision, that it'll it'll feel more you know, that you may sort of see that need. But um, but again, I, I don't have it's it's not enough of a point that I would have an aversion. Yeah. Just just kind of wanted to see if there had been some conversation on it. No, there wasn't. Um, if I could get the applicant to turn on their. Uh, um, Ashley Davies is here. She's vice president of Riverbend Development to represent the, the applicant. I believe she has the, their project engineer as well. If you have even more specific engineering questions, any questions for Ashley? You've done a great job, Miss Ashley. Nobody has questions. All right. Uh, with that, I'm going to open up the public hearing. Um, I hereby open the public hearing. If you wish to participate in the public hearing, you're asked to call 844-844-9200. When asked for a meeting access code, enter 398145, followed by the pound sign. Press the star six. And then you'll be asked if you would like to participate, press one. And once you're uh, in the queue, you'll hear the audio feed of the meeting. Wait until the moderator tells you you can speak, and then you can share your comments with council. Mr. Mayor, is this the public hearing for the subdivision request or the text amendment? Uh, the the sub, uh, subdivision request, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Mayor, we do have one person in the waiting room. Um, and they could be here for any of the public hearings. So I'll go ahead and open this one up. And if that person would like to enter, as you stated, they should hear the prompts now. Session has started. If you're in the waiting room, you uh, please introduce yourself, give us your name and your address and share with council what you want to share. They have entered the um, Q and A session, so I'm going to go ahead and move them into so that you guys, you all, should be able to hear them. Okay. Yes. Am I on? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, this, this is Bobby Henderson, the mayor. Can you? Uh, can I you, have more of a comment to make uh, rather than a question. Is, uh, is this? Is this? In, I live in Waynesboro. And, is this in um, reference to LMM? expansion for uh, Middle River Regional Jail. Um, and I just want to say that before beginning the long, expansive process of expanding our jail, we need to take a critical look at who they're oh. incarcerating and why. They hear and, um, I think we'll likely find that most people incarcerated in the jail are poor and disadvantaged, are nonviolent offenders who cannot afford bail or not given that option. In addition to the plague that we see a racial disparity, and most of these people do not need to be incarcerated, and I believe would be better served um, in the community. I think we do a better job by investing in other programs, such as education. And I believe organizations like RISE here in Waynesboro serves as a model for community education, uplift, and service at the grassroots. They do so much and understand the issues facing our community more than anyone. And I think we do well to invest in an organization like this. We also need to invest in more in addictive and mental health services and to things like food insecurity. Um, in short, I think we'd be better served to invest in ways that would help and uplift those who are at risk, offering human services and opportunities that, can, that could interrupt the pipeline to jail that we see um, and offer something more hopeful and substantial that could really change and improve lives. And uh, that's the end of my comments. Thank you. 
Okay, just so the folks know that are wanting to participate in the public hearing, this is not citizen comment. This is strictly uh, public hearing involving the uh, Rosser Avenue Development LLC preliminary subdivision plat 220, uh, 220 lot residential subdivision. We're not in citizen comment period. If you would like to participate in the public hearing, that's what this section's for. One else is <clears throat> entered the queue, Mr. Mayor. Okay, is there a way that you can find out if they're here for the public hearing or for? There is one other person that's in the attendee section, but they've not come into the Q&A. So I would assume they're either listening to the meeting or here for another section. Okay. All right, with no one else here for the preliminary subdivision, I hereby close this public hearing. Q&A session is over. Is there a motion to introduce the ordinance approving the preliminary subdivision plat? I'll make that motion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Short. Is there a second? I will second that. Thank you, Dr. Hostetter. Is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion, uh, this or can we approve this one tonight or is this one? No. No, okay. Uh, th this ordinance will receive final consideration at our next business meeting on February the 8th. Then we have to hold a public hearing for the text amendment as well. Okay. Uh, we're going to hold, uh, I hereby open a public hearing to hear the uh, comments for the text amendment involving Zero Tiffany Drive. If you want to give comment to the uh, text amendment involving Zero Tiffany Drive, please call 888-844-9200. When you're prompted, enter 398145, followed by the pound sign. You will, uh, press the, uh, you will press star six. After you enter the room, you'll press one. You'll be entered into the uh, room. You'll hear the audio feed of the meeting. Please wait until it's uh, either the public hearing that you're wanting to speak at, we've got five tonight, or the citizen comment period at the end. This public hearing that we're in right now is for the zoning text amendment. Um, anyone in line for this, Mr. McCormick? So the same situation as last time, Mr. Mayor, there's um, one person in the waiting room. I can go ahead and open up the um, question and answer. And if they'd like to speak on the Zero Tiffany Drive, they'll be prompted to enter. Um, and if not, they can feel free to stay in the waiting room to listen to the meeting or, or speak later. Perfect. Okay, thank you. They have not entered as of yet, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. All right, we'll close the public hearing on this matter. Is there a motion to approve the preliminary? Oh, no. Let me move down. Uh, I hereby close the, the hearing. Is there a motion? Uh, I see, Mr. Mayor, if I might interrupt, that's, uh, I've gotten the language there a little goofed up. This is uh, to introduce the ordinance approving uh, the text amendment related to the minimum uh, lot width related to the driveway. Okay. I'll, Sorry, I'll, I'll make that motion. Thank you, Terry. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Uh, any discussion? Is there uh, here no discussion? Uh, it's also the mayor. Say aye. Aye. Uh, whoa, 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 whoa. No, no, no. This carries over till the next meeting, too. Oh, I apologize. This, this will be uh, heard for final consideration at our next business meeting, February the uh, 21st. Or, I'm sorry, February 8th. All right. We've got one more public hearing, and this... All right. Uh, our, item number eight is 
to uh, hold a public hearing to consider introducing an ordinance for section 98.2.4 of the code to add uh, contractor's office to the use table and permit contractor's offices by right in LI, HI, and MXB districts and to add use of standards for contractor's office to section 98.4. The proposed text amendment is initiated by city staff, Mr. Jude. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just to clarify quickly that the proposal is actually initiated by the planning commission and uh, it's to allow them by right in LI and NHI and by conditional use permit in MXB. Okay. So I'll uh, move through the, the presentation here. You see a picture here of Blue Ridge doors over on Charlotte Avenue. That's an example of the type of use that we're discussing. Uh, this would be contracting and servicing companies like HVAC, plumbing, electrician, framing windows, other construction companies. Uh, it's a type of use that generally requires an office space, a customer facing space of some kind for people to come in and out, usually a little bit of parts of warehousing, some outdoor storage, and then parking for their service and delivery vehicles. So it's, it's kind of a, um, a jack of all trades use, um, and it doesn't fit very neatly into our current zoning code. As it is, the zoning administrator has uh, classified them as light industrial, so they are allowed only in light industrial areas. Um, there are a number of them that are non-conforming, and there are quite a few that are on light industrial properties over in the basic city area. Um, currently, as I said, they, they exist in a gray zone. Because of that, we'd like to add them explicitly to the use table um, because there's often issues about whether they could be retail, whether they could be whatever else. And so we'd like to add them to the use table um, more explicitly um, and allow them by right in the LI and HI zone, the industrial zone. Because they require smaller, less expensive sites, um, and they don't need visibility from major corridors, they're often interested in older, smaller, they're sort of prime users for your small old buildings or small old commercial industrial buildings that aren't on main corridors, uh, which is a lot of the kind of buildings that are scattered around the basic city area where we're trying to do the new MXB zone. Um, this creates a little bit of an issue because Aesthetically, they're really not ideal uses near residences. It's not really what you want to live next to. Um, but they're also not high nuisance uses. They usually don't involve any kind of pollution or um, a lot of noise or, you know, they're generally working normal hours. Um, and so there's some even issue of whether they should be allowed in, in that area. And because there are a couple of them that are already there, um, if we move ahead with rezoning a lot of the area that we'd like to rezone to MXB, uh, we'll cause some of them to become non-conforming. And that'll create a little bit of an issue uh, with that rezoning. So to get out ahead of that, we would like to recommend adding contractors' offices to the use table and allowing them by right in the LI and HI district. We discussed allowing them by right in the MXB district as well. The Planning Commission um, was, wasn't comfortable with that and felt that they should, we should be allowing them by conditional use permit. Um, that means that every time that one wanted to locate in one of those buildings, they would have to come to council for a conditional use permit. Um, and so that's uh, not something that we want to use very often. but. Um, it's okay for uses that may be appropriate um, if you can kind of see what it looks like, et cetera. Um, the proposal also involves adding some use standards, um, such as allowing vehicle and equipment storage only as an accessory use to an office or retail use. So we don't want to allow just, you know, a junkyard in the middle of this neighborhood. Um, but we would allow some vehicle storage as a secondary accessory use. You could park the contracting vehicles there, et cetera, um, but would require some screening. So that's the situation. Um, as I said before, we're hoping to bring you all a rezoning soon that would change a lot of the property over there to the new MXB zone, which we've been working on for that area. Um, and we know that if you don't uh, pass this text amendment or if you um, don't allow these explicitly, that will make a lot of those businesses non-conforming. So, for instance, this is a, a Usler's Plumbing here, which is located, uh, I believe, on Dinwiddie, or maybe it's the next street over. Um, here's Blue Ridge Doors, which is on Charlotte. Um, but that type of building exists. Um, there's quite a few of those types of buildings and those types of businesses in that area. Um, so this is attempting to figure out what to do with that exactly. If we allow them by CUP, we can issue CUPs for those existing uses, um, but any new ones would have to come to council. If we allow it by right, then um, you know that kind of use could go into any building that's in this district, the MXB district. Uh, questions for me about that? Mr. Jude, so what we're voting on tonight is to make L1 and H1 districts 
add the, the language for the contractor's office in those districts and conditional use permit in the MXB district. Right. And, I, mm -hmm. and okay. this won't really change anything right now after your vote because they, uh, Laura already allows them an LI district. That's kind of the, what we figured out, um, even with the gray definition. Uh, and we obviously don't have any properties that are zoned MXB yet, though we will have quite a few of them soon. Um, so it won't change anything immediately, but it's the bigger point here is for that MXB rezoning to be ready, kind of cleaned up for that. And Mr. Jude, following up on that, my recollection is that the anticipation is that those existing uh, businesses, we will issue CUPs with the rezoning um, so that we're not chasing anybody away. It'll be more an issue of then if new businesses are looking to come in there. Yes, uh, we have had uh, some advice from a legal counsel that we should maybe hold off on issuing CUPs for some of these things. That um, it's going to create some additional complexity, but it would give them the opportunity to seek a CUP. We may send them letters and ask them if they would like a CUP. That we'll we'll do that free of charge for them now. Um, it, nothing that even if they were becoming non-conforming, it wouldn't chase anybody away because you know they'd be grandfathered when you change the zoning on an existing use that existing use has the right to continue um, until it closes or shuts down um, but yeah you're right it would mainly be addressing new new users any other questions for mr jude all right uh, i hereby open the public hearing to hear uh, citizen comment or public comment on uh, zoning text amendment contractors offices by right. Uh, if you want to participate in this public hearing, you will call 844-844-9200. Uh, once you hear the uh, access code, enter 398145, followed by the pound sign You'll be asked if you want to be uh, our, you're, enter the question and answering session, you'll hit star six. Then you'll be asked if you want to speak to press the number one to be put in queue. Uh, you'll hear the audio feed of the meeting. If you're hearing the audio feed of the meeting uh, and you're wanting to speak on the text amendment for contractors offices, it'll be time to enter the room. If you're waiting for another public hearing, please wait and we'll announce uh, when the time is to enter the room. Mr. McCormick. Yes, sir. So again, similar situation to last time we have three people in the waiting room. So I'll open the question and answer for the um, zoning text amendment for contractors offices. offices. And if um, the citizens in the waiting room would like to speak on this, on the contractor's offices, they can enter, should be able to enter now. Anything, Mr. McCormick? No, sir. Okay. I hereby close the public hearing. And hearing day session is over. Is there a motion to uh, move the public hearing or the amendment forward? I will make that motion. Thank you, Dr. Hofstetter. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Uh, this ordinance will be received for final consideration at our next business meeting on February the 8th, 2021. This brings us to item number nine. Item number nine is to uh, presentation from Jeffrey Newton, the superintendent of Middle, Regional Reg Regional Middle River Regional Jail, regarding the need for facility expansion and various concepts of uh, expansion. Considering, uh, consider providing guidance the city manager regarding the expansion of the facility. Uh, we had a, a, a work session before. Once we received this, I think council to take some time to, to think about what we're hearing tonight, but we'll uh, let city manager know where we stand once we get all the information. Um, so, Mr. Ham. Mr. Mayor, if I might provide just a very brief introductory remarks for the superintendent, um, whose attendance we appreciate this evening. 
currently the average daily populations due to increasing incarceration um, exceed the operational capacity of the Middle River Regional Jail and prompts the member jurisdictions to consider expansion options for the facility. Uh, facility capacity is expressed in two separate and distinct terms. Rated capacity is determined by the Department of Corrections and is the basis on which state compensation board funding or state support uh, for the facility is established. Operational uh, capacity refers to the number of inmates that can be served adequately in a facility. Um, Middle River Regional Jail has a rated capacity of 396 and an operational capacity of 600. Uh, both of these figures are original to the construction and opening of uh, the facility in 2006. Key considerations in operational capacity include staff, and more relevant to our conversation this evening, core infrastructure such as food service, medical service, visitation, um, laundry, and uh, those common core uh, facilities and um, essential infrastructure of the institution. The average daily population for the jail for the calendar year 2020 was 843. Of those 843, an average of 37 inmates were on home electronic incarceration. Uh, resulting in an average population in the facility of 806, which we note exceeds both the rated and operational capacities um, for the jail. We should note further that um, that 843 or 806 number are understated given efforts um, currently or ongoing to manage and reduce jail populations during the pandemic and public health emergency. Occasionally since 2015, um, populations in the facility have spiked to exceed 1,000. Um, the increasing inmate population places stress on the facility and the staff there. And at the same time, expansion solutions are expensive and contemplated during a time of economic recession and uncertainty um, due to the pandemic. All that to say, we recognize as staff that the proposition of expanding the facility at this time um, is a difficult proposition for elected bodies and for the authority itself. Um, the Commonwealth has an established structured process by which construction and expansion of local jails is evaluated and funded. Um, when Middle River Regional Jail was constructed, the Commonwealth contribu contributed 50% of eligible capital costs. Um, presently, the Commonwealth contributes 25% of elig eligible expenses for approved projects. Um, this evening, Superintendent Newton will um, provide an overview of process and history here and uh, provide some focused information about the various solutions um, that the authority has considered. I would like to thank um, Mr. Newton and his staff uh, for their responsiveness to persistent uh, pressing by the authority to develop um, additional options um, that balance um, what is becoming an urgent need for additional space at the facility with um, the obvious concern of um, expense for expansion at the facility. And uh, with that, um, we'll hand it over to Mr. Newton. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Hamp. Thank you. Uh, I, I hope uh, everybody can hear me all right. Yes, sir. All right. I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully, this will work. Yes, sir. All right, great. Thank you. Well, again, thank you very much, uh, members of the council, Mr. Mayor, for inviting me to speak this evening. I'm going to walk through the presentation. Please, if at uh, any time you have a question, stop me, and I'll be glad to address the question at that time. And then at the end, I'll, I'll certainly be glad to entertain any questions you might have. So we're going to talk about the items that uh, Mr. Amp Hamp introduced. We'll talk a little bit about the background, cover that briefly. I'm going to talk about the process that you get authorization to expand from the Commonwealth. Uh, review some of the historical work that we've done uh, and then uh, bring us into where we currently are and what the status of the project is and what we're looking to have happen here in the next couple of weeks. 
This is a frame of reference in case anybody does not know where the jail is located. Uh, we're in Augusta County, uh, uh, right next to the youth center. You can see the represented there, the Augusta County Government Center. That's right along uh, Commerce Avenue or Route 11. So we're kind of in between Route 11 and Interstate 81, uh, right there in uh, Verona. So as Mr. Hatt mentioned, <clears throat> original uh, jail was the regional jail was constructed in 2006. Original members were, of course, cities of Waynesboro, Stanton, and Augusta County. In uh, 2015, uh, city of Harrisonburg and Rockingham County joined the authority as full members. As Mr. Hatt mentioned, our rated capacity from 2006 and remains so today is 396. But the core of the facility, all those mechanical systems, food service, uh, HVAC, hot water, uh, kitchen, were all designed anticipating that the jail might house 150% capacity, which is about 600 inmates. As you can see, we've, we've struggled a little bit with uh, the number of offenders we've, we've housed. And in uh, calendar year 2020, it was 843, with 806 being resident to the facility. You can see here on this slide, we've struggled even more in the past, and uh, rate, you know, with our uh, peaking in uh, 2019, housing 923 citizens on a daily basis, which is 233% of our capacity. So how did the process work? So what ha needs to happen is the authority needs to uh, develop what's called a community-based corrections plan. That's the vehicle that we get approval from the state to uh, add additional beds. The plan has two parts. There's a needs assessment piece, which looks at what the needs of the authority will be for the next 10 years. And in our case, that would be through 2029 because we um, started this process back in 2019. That needs assessment determined that we would need, the authority would need 1,283 beds come 2029. The second piece of the community-based corrections plan is the planning study. And that's where you look at, okay, what your need is, how do we respond to that need? And so we're gonna look at some of the options from the planning study about how we would respond to meet those, those beds. So the authority um, reviewed the community-based corrections plan and approved its submission to the Department of Corrections back in December of 2019. That document gets reviewed by the Department of Corrections and then gets submitted to the Board of Local and Regional Jails, what you used to call the Board of Corrections, but the legislature renamed that to the Board of Local and Regional Jails in 2020. That was reviewed by that board in September of last year. and. It, and approved a plan for 400 bed expansion. So what happens next? Normally what happens is the governor would include that plan in his budget recommendation for the next fiscal year for consideration by the legislature. That did not happen this year. So we approached uh, Senator Hanger and De Delegate Avoli to submit budget amendments on behalf of the jail authority, which they have done. So we will be considered in this next legislative session as part of that budget. And we need um, the project to be included as part of the budget to be eligible for that 25% reimbursement Mr. Hamp talked about earlier. As a staff, we need to receive some guidance from the board of directors of the jail authority as to what they desire us to do, whether we are going to do a project and what the size or shape of that uh, project might do, might be. And if we are going to do a project, how the board wants us to proceed towards obtaining financing. So here on this slide, we're representing some of the historical plans that we presented to the authority for consideration when we submitted the community-based corrections plan to the jail authority for their review and approval. See, they're fairly uh, diverse in their um, size. What, uh, what we asked the authority to do if they were gonna submit a community-based corrections plan was to submit a plan for the largest option because it's easier to scale a project down than it is to scale a project up. Once we got approval from the, jail, from the Board of Local and Regional Jails, we could build something smaller, but we would have a difficult time building something bigger uh, without going back and starting the process again. So in December of 19, as part of our community-based corrections plan, the authority did submit the plan considering option A, which you can see is a pretty 
significant price tag. In December of uh, last year, our, at our December board meeting, the chairman asked to put on the agenda for uh, the architects and my staff to review with the jail authority what the options were. We did that. It was clear to me and my staff that there really wasn't appetite on the, uh, the jail authority for a large project. So we took the project back and met with the, the architects and really redesigned how we presented the project, trying to reduce the project down to digestible pieces. We're focusing on uh, these five key issues that are identified here on this slide. Obviously, we've got some renovation that we need to do because of the age of the facility. We want to focus on adding capacity and increasing capacity to deliver a good community correction supervision. We want to better address uh, the folks in our custody that have an underlying mental health issue. Obviously, our real need is increase in capacity of general population, minimum custody beds. And then, of course, we wanted to expand our capacity to deliver good maintenance to the facility. So those were the overarching pieces when we developed our plans. So we recommended to the authority some renovation in the main facility. Uh, we wanted to address expansion of the kitchen because of increase in population. When we originally constructed the facility, uh, we had uh, professional visitation that was not completed. We wanted to complete that. We wanted to enhance security in our lobby for staff. We need to increase property storage for inmates because we designed the facility for 600 inmates for property storage and we've got uh, a number more than that. So we need to add some property space. And we wanted to move where our current magistrate office is. The current magistrate office, we have one here at the facility. It's inside the secure perimeter of the jail and is not accessible to the general public. And we wanted to move it outside the secure perimeter to make it more accessible for the general public. And then we want to repurpose uh, that, that arrow that points to the new mental health area. That's currently our medical clinic. Part of the proposal is we want to build a new medical clinic and we want to repurpose that for service for um, a mental health staff that's not designed for housing of inmates with an underlying mental health issue that's purely designed as an administrative space for staff and you can see those renovations uh, those are the highlights it's about four and a half million dollars to do all that renovation that we had proposed to do we want to expand our capacity to deliver uh, good service to those in our custody with uh, mental health issues so we had proposed two different units um, 48, uh, 24 individual cells a piece, about $2.3 million. Uh, you could build one, you could build two. Uh, it could house all the classification of offenders we have. This is the current schematic of the building. You can see where the highlighted area is, are two areas of the jail that were not completed when we originally constructed the main facility. We would propose to build those two units um, and classify them for service to uh, folks with underlying mental health issues. Any questions? Minimum custody beds. Core need for the facility. Uh, we just uh, need to expand our capacity to manage the general population of the facility. Proposal is to add um, a housing unit with dormitory housing, 192 beds, could house minimum custody or medium custody inmates. Again, the schematic of the building, when the architects uh, originally designed, they sketched out where potential additions could be placed for the building. This is one of those spaces. It's west of what we currently, where we currently house our female offenders. And it would be four dormitories, 48 beds apiece. To address our growing need for community uh, corrections, Capacity. We're proposing a separate building for 112 beds for folks that would uh, work in the community and return to the jail at the end of the day in either a work release capacity or a community service capacity working for one of the jurisdictions or some volunteer organization in our community. The key piece about this facility, it could not be used to house minimum custody inmates. The construction standards would not meet that. It could only be used for uh, folks that uh, work in our community. And we're proposing to do that in the parking lot to the south of the main building. This is the main jail here. This is the youth center over here. It would be, there's space here to build that building right there. 
and support services. Um, remember, we talked about when we built the building, um, 396 rated capacity, but the core systems were designed anticipating 150% capacity. Historically, for the last four or five years, we've been well over 200% capacity. So we need to um, create more capacity to serve that population. We need a larger medical unit to serve the folks that are in our custody with health concerns. We need to expand our kitchen so we can easier prepare the meals we prepare on a daily basis. Uh, we need, uh, uh, when we place the laundry in the main building, we can't modify or change the current laundry, so we've got to build a new laundry. Uh, there just isn't any space inside the building where they put the laundry to do that. And then, of course, we need to respond to uh, administrative space to create more office space for staff to be able to uh, better serve the uh, management of the facility. And the proposal from the architects is to build that, this is the current administrative area, is to build that just west of, uh, of, uh, of the current administrative space. It does not impact our ability to do any other additional building to the facility that uh, some future authority may choose to do. It's not going to be big enough to impinge on, on any of that. The last piece for expansion was uh, maintenance and warehouse. When we built uh, the original building, uh, the maintenance facility was value engineered out of the project. We have a small maintenance building that's been added in the last 15 years. It just does not meet the capacity of uh, the level of maintenance and support we need to have for the facility. And then the warehouse space obviously is inside the main building. It's not big enough for us to uh, buy in bulk and store in bulk, uh, so we're, we're proposing a combination maintenance and uh, warehouse facility. So <clears throat> we looked at a number of different options, um, a lot of cookie cutter pieces that you could um, pick and choose what you wanted to do. Uh, this is a potential uh, project. Uh, we could do this or we could do something different or we could do part of this. But um, this is a potential project that uh, we've laid out for the uh, jail authority. It certainly is not the only option that is available if a project is chosen. You can see the cost of the project would be about $39.5 million. The state share would be close to 10. So the authority would be responsible for uh, about $29,600 million, $29.6 million. This would add... 352 beds to the current 396 beds that we currently have. Questions about that? Cost assumptions. So we're going to show you a slide here in a minute that's going to lay out what we think the additional cost would be if you chose to do that particular project. Mr. Hamp mentioned about rated bed capacity. Rated bed capacity drives funding for staffing from the state. Personnel costs are based on how many folks we actually house at a facility. The other costs are about um, what the new additional space would cost as far as utilities and maintenance, and then uh, an estimate about what debt service would cost. So this is what that project would look like come fiscal year 24. See, personnel costs would increase about $9.3 million. Other costs, that's the utilities, maintenance, whatever, about $2 million. Debt, $1.9. So that $1.9 million is essentially doubling the current debt service payment that the authority already has for the current project. So a $40 million project doubles your current debt service payment. So for a total increase of uh, $13.3 million, Compensation Board would uh, provide you staffing defrayment uh, of almost $5 million. So the true net increase to the authority come 2024 would be 8.375. So what's next? Uh, we, prevented, we provided uh, this uh, uh, presentation to the uh, Authority Board at their December meeting. We had a special meeting the Chairman called on the 7th of January to look at the updated options that uh, have been developed by staff and the architect. We're looking for some guidance from the authority at their meeting next week as to uh, if 
we're going to do a project, and if we are, what the shape and size of that would be. That drives then negotiating an architectural contract, uh, retention of bond council, so that we could come back to the authority at our April meeting for approval of those contracts. And then assuming that the project is included in the state budget, we would be eligible to begin design July 1st. It's a pretty aggressive timeline. We've been working on a pretty aggressive timeline since I got here in, in uh, June of 19. But even with that aggressive timeline, and assuming we get approval to pr proceed with any project, we don't get a new bed till December of 23. So we got to deal with the population we've got for another three years uh, as we work through this process. And that only assumes if the authority decides to proceed with the project. So I want to talk to you a little bit about criminal justice reform. There's been a lot of dialogue. The, the legislature met in a special session last fall with a lot of work around this particular issue. And um, some, of the, some of the criminal justice reform, I think, is going to directly impact uh, Middle River Regional Jail. One of the key pieces of legislation that was passed was um, changing how uh, earned good time can be earned by offenders that are sentenced to the Department of Corrections potentially changing that from five days a month to up to 15 days a month. So the estimate is, and we don't know for sure, but the estimate is by uh, 2023, that's going to reduce the number of offenders in the Department of Corrections, about 1,400 offenders. And then the assumption is those 1,400 free beds would be filled by offenders coming from local and regional jails. So you do the math backward to Middle River, that may reduce our population by 60 offenders a day. The population projection for 2029 is 1283. Population projection prior to that change was 1060 in 2024. So we figure our pop the projection may be we need 1,000 beds come 2024 as opposed to 1,060. What other two criminal justice reforms going to occur in this current legislative session or next year's? I'm not really sure. An example would be if um, the legislature gets pretty radical and decides to eliminate mandatory minimum sentences. So instead of a five-year mandatory sentence for a particular offense, it's a two-year. Or instead of a 10-year, it's a five-year. I don't think that's going to affect the jail because that person's still going to come to jail and then work their way to the Department of Corrections. So even though it may, in the out years, have an impact on the number of folks in the Department of Corrections, I'm not sure what it's going to mean yet for Middle River Regional Jail, but we're going to monitor that and see. So we need to increase capacity for community-based programs. We need a facility to do that with. And we need a creative solution if we're going to do a project that provides staff here at the jail with the most flexibility to manage the future population that we're not really sure what that's going to be yet. I'm ready to answer any questions if you have so. Hey, um, I, got, I got one here. What is the average type of offense that you've got in your regional jail? I mean, what are those folks doing in your jail? Well, Mr. Mayor, um, it runs the gamut, right? So I think it's important for everybody to understand that anybody that um, – works their way towards a sentence in the Department of Corrections starts at Middle River Regional Jail. So we can have folks that are in our custody for a misdemeanor, and we can have folks in our custody for some pretty significant felony offenses. Um, and it runs the gamut. We can certainly uh, provide some uh, uh, specific data to Mr. Hamp that he can provide to you if that's what you desire. Uh, but it's uh, on any given day, it's hard to tell you what they are. Uh, Mr. Newton, I, this is Dr. Hoster. I've got a question as well. Um, uh, what is the average length of stay? Because it sounds like a lot of folks there are moving through the process. Um, how long do you have the, them for on average uh, in that process? Thank you, Dr. Hoster. It's, um, I'm, I'm not going to be able to answer that question because um, it's um, difficult to assess 
and um, it really depends on each individual case. As an example, uh, if you're in, if the offender's in our custody and facing uh, a significant felony charge, they may be here four years working their way through the criminal justice system. And then we may have somebody in our custody 24 hours waiting to make their bond. So I don't, I'm not sure, I've never found utility in average length of stay at a jail because it really is individually, why is that person here and um, what has contributed to why they're still here? So I, I know that's not as, as responsive as you want, but I, I just, uh, I haven't found the utility in the average length of stay because I look at individual cases. Fair enough. With, with your new, uh, if, if we approve funding here and you got a new mental health wing, what kind of services are we going to be providing with that mental health wing? Mr. Mayor, thank you for, for asking that question. So I think it's important for uh, you to understand that we are not a mental health treatment facility. We don't provide um, uh, treatment to those in our custody with an underlying mental health issue. We contract with the community service board. We have full four full-time clinicians in our employ that are uh, provided to us by the community service board. And we do that because uh, we believe that somebody in our custody is gonna receive services from the community service board when they're not in our custody. And we should, we wanna connect those services and that's why we contract with them. So we, do, we provide counseling services to those offenders. We provide group um, work. So there's group sessions and they're all designed around coping mechanisms to better deal with the fact that they are incarcerated and working their way through the criminal justice system. Um, and then um, the, the clinicians work very closely with our psychiatrist, so we manage um, medication and ensure that the, the offenders in our custody are taking the appropriate medication that they've been prescribed by the psychiatrist. So we did a lot of work around crisis intervention, group counseling, um, uh, helping folks better cope with the circumstances they have and um, getting them on the appropriate medication. But we're not, we're not a treatment facility. And what we're looking to do with the additional space is just to provide, just to have better, more space and better space for that population. Mr. Newton, Bruce Allen here. Uh, I retired from Lanesboro City Sheriff's Office 16, 17 years ago, so a lot of things have changed. And I've only been to your jail once or twice for tours. Never served any time there. Uh, in the question of people there waiting for trial and people there serving their sentences, and you might have said this and I missed it, but do you have a, a, a number of how many is actually sitting there waiting to be tried and how many are actually serving their time? Generally speaking, now, <clears throat> COVID year is a little bit different because um, we've um, worked aggressively with the Commonwealth attorney in the court to shift folks earlier from our custody. So a lot of low level offenders um, got put on house arrest or furlough. So 2020 is kind of an odd year for us. So generally though, about 60% of our folks in our custody are waiting from some, for some action from the court and 40 are either serving their sentence or waiting for transfer for the Department of Corrections. So it's about a 60-40 split. Um, that's generally true. It may not be true today because of, the, because of COVID, but that's generally what we're seeing. And I uh, heard you say, or it was told earlier, a uh, lot of the people that would be normally sentenced to a state penitentiary are being held up now because they're overcrowded and uh, not taking people because of COVID. But in my time, if somebody got more than 12 months, they stayed at your facility until there was a bed space available in a state correctional unit. And that's when we would move them. Uh, what percentage of the, the, the ones you say that are sitting there serving their time are ones that should be over into the state corrections now? Well, today our population is about 785 and about one in four of those folks should be in the Department of Corrections. One in four. Yes, sir. 
and and I think we had asked, we had the question earlier when we were uh, uh, had a work session before this meeting. At that point, the cost of that person sitting here normally they would have been transferred into the state, and I think the cost goes there then. But now if it's here, we're still taking care of it. Are we paying a hundred percent of that. Well, for a state responsible offender, we receive four dollars a day. When they get to the point where they're eligible to move to the Department of Corrections, we get $12 a day. It costs you about $56 a day to house somebody here. So we're getting the short end of the stick. <laughs> all right. I think that's all the questions I have. I have a couple follow-up. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, uh, first, to... So actually, I'll go in reverse here. You, you mentioned a little bit about pre, you know COVID being an odd, a uh, different year um, for all of us, and certainly your work, um, and that you had walked, worked diligently with with the judges and the Commonwealth Attorney's Office to for the uh, to reduce the overall population for for uh, a lesser crime individuals and and those that could operate through ankle bracelet or home monitoring or otherwise work release or what have you. Um, I guess the question would be, uh, I'm assuming that's a successful program and, you know, would we, what your thoughts are moving forward to continue those, those efforts so that we aren't doing doubling down on incarceration even once the pandemic is over? Well, I think they've been very successful programs. And I think we have, we have demonstrated, um, and we communicate periodically and provide periodic reports to the Commonwealth Attorney in the court about who's out and how successful we are and things of that nature. And I think they are meritous of consideration for continuing past COVID. Uh, but that's not a decision that I can make. That's a decision that the court and the Commonwealth Attorney, I think, uh, uh, need to make but I think we've demonstrated the ability to manage those programs, to manage them safely, um, to enforce the rules of the program. Uh, and the way you test that is you have some people fail, so you bring them back to jail. And I think that just reinforces the fact that the program is successful. So we would be more than willing to expand those, but um, you know, I, that's a decision that needs to be made by the court and the Commonwealth Attorney. I think as an example, in the spring when COVID came, um, working with the Commonwealth Attorney and the court, we got our population below 700. And then come July, we slowly saw our population climb up to October, we were over 900. And so when we had our outbreak here, we asked the court to stop people coming to jail um, who were self-reporting to serve sentences, asked the magistrate to be a little more aggressive with bonds, and so we've now been able to hold the population right about 800. So what's the difference between the spring and today? I think the difference is the low hanging fruit, those low level offenders from the spring got released. And we've got in our custody the folks that the Commonwealth Attorney and the court think need to be in our custody. And so I think that's really the difference for us. And I think that's really truly representative of what we're gonna house. So I don't think we're going to reduce our population another 100 with house arrests and um, and work release because I don't think I have folks that there's an appetite to put those about folks out on the program. Now in the future there probably is, but uh, well, and that's 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 where I'm a little foreshadowing a little bit is that I think I know I, I would I imagine other members of council would be very interested to uh, hear back from you in six months, you know, and then hopefully once the vaccines are sort of hitting, and that it, you know in what way could why, might we serve as uh, uh, an advocate uh, you know, to the Commonwealth Attorney's Office to to uh, uh, to advocate on on your behalf. If you're seeing positive outcomes, I think we need to be supportive of that. It it helps uh, and potentially to help not only our community, though our bottom lines of our community, but more importantly those that are that would otherwise be incarcerated. Uh, I, let me just say this: that you know, Mr. Ledbetter has been a huge supporter. He's been uh, very aggressive in. Uh, looking at those folks in our custody and taking the appropriate action that his office thinks is appropriate. So I don't want to cast any aspersion on any, anybody that says they're not doing what they, they they're it's appropriate for their office to do. He's been, uh, each of the Commonwealth attorneys that uh, serve our jurisdictions has done a yeoman's job 
uh, supporting our efforts to manage the population. So, absolutely, we've got the same opinion of them. So, yeah, he's, he's done a great job for us. Um, question uh, regarding uh, uh, the, that mental health wing, I think was mentioned earlier. And so you've got four full-time clinicians from uh, uh, under contract community service board. And then, so they then um, offer up recommendations to uh, the, 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 the jail's psychiatrist, right? right. So I, you know, I imagine um, I, I've appreciated my colleagues' questions uh, uh, so far because I think it's, it's evidence that we've all heard more or less from a lot of the same people, right? Because we're, we're, you're, 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 kidding, you're kicking off my questions one after the other. So I think that's great. Um, one of the ones that came up was um, uh, whether or not the, 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 the jail has a full-time psychiatrist or not. And so the ability to take those recommendations from the clinicians and to uh, um, act quickly uh, through medic through uh, medication or otherwise, or uh, that would require a prescription. And that um, so I guess the question that I was I was told and I don't know if it's true or not is that is that is it, do we have a full time psychiatrist there? And if we don't, if it's part time, do you see that as a problem? What are some challenges or or are things sort of operating? Would you disagree with with what I've heard? We do not have a full time psychiatrist. We have a part time psychiatrist. Um, but I think, and that's one of the one of the areas we look at each year in our budget cycle, is do we have enough hours of psychiatric service for the population we have in our custody? And um, we made some pretty significant changes in our medical service delivery uh, in the last 18 months because we determined we weren't delivering the level of care. And the jail authority has been very supportive in adding additional medical staff at our request in our budget cycle because we didn't have the coverage we needed. But this is an area I think that we do have um, enough coverage because we're not a, a, a mental health treatment facility. We're really a facility that's designed to keep people safe and, and prepare, have that person ready for action from the court. So I don't think we need, for the number of offenders we have in our custody, based on my professional experience, I don't think we need a full-time psychiatrist. If we were a mental health treatment facility, we'd need a couple of psychiatrists. So. Uh, but that's not our role in, in the criminal justice system. Uh, if we, uh, as part of expansion, if we add that area for mental health delivery, we would look to add additional clinicians so that we could do more group work. Uh, we would probably increase the hours of the psychiatrist, but I'm not sure I envision um, a full-time psychiatrist. I've, I've run jails um, with 1,700 offenders, and we didn't have a full-time full psychiatrist there either. Now we had uh, more mental health staff and we may have had a nurse practitioner with mental health training, but we didn't have a full-time psychiatrist. So I'm not sure um, that we have the population that needs that. Yeah, well, that's helpful. I mean, I think you, you've answered my, my, my question and I think it's, 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 it's um, I, I'm taking it as, a, as positive feedback that um, uh, should the expansion move forward that, you know, again, with, with the you know i've heard some statistics as high as you know 20 20 30 percent um of, of, of those uh under your care uh that you know may have mental health issues that uh that w in in the absence of receiving care and uh if they're uh if they don't receive that care and then they're released to the general population again the recidivism it, it contributes to the recidivism rate. and so um um, so one, I think there's one a structural uh, question that I think you've done a good job of, 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 of helping me understand that with the expansion, there's that potential to expand clinicians and additional services. Uh, but then there's a uh, uh, philosophical role, right? Uh, st also structural, the philosophical role of the role of, of jails and their role in, in, um, medical services uh, to the, for, for mental health. And so that's, that's super helpful for me. And I think um, we'd, uh, uh, we'll certainly talk to my colleagues about, you know, what role we might play in, um, uh, in, in creating some conversations with our state leadership. So thank you very much. Mr. Newton. 
do you know uh, have the statistics as to how many people that are incarcerated now this is their first incarceration and how many of them are repeat uh, Mr. Allen, I don't have that number handy for me, and I'm not, uh, I'm not sure uh, how I'm going to capture that for you. I could certainly answer the question, how many is it a first time at Middle River? That's, that's what I'm talking about, sir. Yeah, but I, couldn't I'm sorry. But I couldn't answer the question as to whether that's the first time they've been incarcerated, because they right. may have been incarcerated at Albemarle Charlottesville, Rockbridge, Harrison to Rockingham. So um, let me... Uh, let me think about your question and see if I can't feed uh, back some data to Mr. Hamp about that for you. Thank okay. you, sir. Mr. Newton, I have one, one more question for you, sir. And I, I appreciate your patience tonight in setting with us. Um, I've heard from many constituents that our incarceration is double the national average. Any idea where that statistic comes from? I would have no idea. Is it, would you say that's a true statistic or is that? I, Mr. Mayor, without knowing what the source of that data was, I wouldn't know. Um, <clears throat> certainly the fact that we're running at 200% capacity would indicate, would support that statement. We have to understand the history of the facility. We built the facility to serve three jurisdictions. Now we're serving five. So we're going to have more offenders because of that fact alone. Um, generally speaking, I think nationally, the last several years, the trend has been that the, the number of people being incarcerated is falling off. It's dropping. Uh, this is a cyclical issue. Sometimes it climbs, sometimes it drops. But for Middle River, that doesn't happen to be the case. Um, and it's hard to separate out the impact of uh, accepting two new members of Harrison Rockingham back in 2015 as to whether that trend would continue or not. Um, I can tell you that um, without, if you just pull out the number of offenders we have that we're housing for Harrison Rockingham and just look at the three original members, we're over 150% capacity. So we'd be had, there's more than 600 offenders here just from our three original member jurisdictions. So your facility would be kind of at its point where you'd be looking to build on your own if you hadn't accepted the other two members. So thank you, sir. It's a life cycle. Anyone else have any more questions for Mr. Newton? Well, sir, I don't see anybody raising their hand or coming up. We want to thank you very much for coming and talking with us tonight and spending time. Um, I can speak for myself, and I hope I speak for the rest of the council. It was very informative and presented good information for us. Thank you, sir. If anybody has any additional information that comes up afterwards in one of your work sessions, please just ask Mr. Hamp to send me an email. I'll get you uh, the answers to your questions. Uh, come up <laughs> If you wouldn't mind if we get a copy of your, of your presentation from this evening, that would be great. Very helpful. Certainly can. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Hemp, we'll get back with you after we've uh, talked amongst ourselves and give you some guidance and advice from us. Okay, sir? Thank you, sir. Appreciate okay. it. All right. With that, we'll move on to item number 10, and that's to receive information regarding the renewal of the Augusta Regional Landfill Management Agreement and consider authorizing the city manager and or the mayor to execute the agreement on behalf of the city. Mr. Howe. Mayor Henderson and members of council, this is also a regional issue, but um, far less complicated and um, not a financial consideration this evening. The regional jail is owned by the County of Augusta and the cities of Stanton and Waynesboro. We contract with the Augusta County Service Authority to operate and manage the landfill on our behalf. Um, the, we have an agreement or a contract with them that expresses and documents the expectations and standards and duties um, which we rely on the service authority to perform. Um, that contract expired and it's necessary to renew it. Um, the agenda briefing outlines in some detail of uh, those responsibilities, broad responsibilities and expectations for the service authority. 
um, this evening. I'm simply seeking authorization to renew that contract and um, grant authorization to either the mayor or the city manager to sign on behalf of the city. Any questions for Mr. Hamp? Hearing none, is there a motion to uh, renew the, the contract? I'd make that motion. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Is there a second? A second. Thank you, Mr. Short. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye in a show of hands. Aye. Uh, aye. Any opposed? This motion carries 5-0. Thank you all. Uh, the next is to have another public hearing. Uh, hold a public hearing and receive comment on the city of Waynesboro seeking relief from Governor, Gother Governor Northrum's H uh, House Bill 5005 utility disconnect moratorium. Mr. Shaw. Mr. Mayor, members of council, this is actually a follow-up to a conversation we had at your January 11th meeting uh, concerning the governor's uh, moratorium on utility disconnections for non-payment as well as uh, some coronavirus relief funds that have been provided to help folks who are struggling to pay utility bills. On November 18, Governor Northam signed into law House Bill 5005, which among other things, placed a moratorium on public and private utility disconnections for non-payment. The moratorium will remain in effect until the governor determines that the economic and public health conditions have improved or until at least 60 days after the declared public health state of emergency ends. The bill does outline a process by which a utility provider may file for relief from the disconnect moratorium if, in the case of a public utility, the provider's amount in account arrears exceeds 1% of its annual operating uh, budget. Arrearages include past due receivables that are up to uh, four years old, and beyond that, the receivable is considered to be uh, uncollectible. Uh, we've provided the council with some information that demonstrates that in the city water fund, we have arrearages of um, a little more than $159,000 against a budget of about $4.2 million or revenues of about $4.2 million in the fund. So our arrearages are about 3.8%, um, certainly exceeds the 1% standard. And likewise, in the sewer fund, we have arrearages in amount of $253,000 against a $6.1 million revenue budget. So the arrearage is there about 4.1%. So overall, in the two utilities, our arrearages are about 4%. In order to obtain relief from the moratorium, the local utility must, one, provide written analysis to demonstrate the 1% arrears exceedance, and we have, have done that. We've provided information to the public and uh, to the council as well. And then uh, finally, the utilities governing body must verify this exceedance and um, provide public notice of its intent to consider obtaining relief, receive public comment, and vote to approve the exceedance and is accurate in an open public meeting. So we have advertised um, this uh, meeting and we've had information again available to the public um, for, for their examination. In the event of an affirmative vote on the utilities governing body, you, the city council, then uh, we would thereafter be exempt from the moratorium as outlined in House Bill 5005. In addition to the declaration of discount moratorium, the House bill requires that utility providers must notify customers whose bill is more than 30 days in arrears of the availability of a repayment plan that would amortize the repayment of the customer's utility debt over a minimum period of six months and up to a maximum of 24 months, depending on the customer's financial ability to pay. The locality may require the customer attest that they've ex, uh, experienced a financial hardship, either resulting from the public health emergency or during the public health emergency. Uh, the city of Waynesboro has effect, uh, notified such affected customers and uh, we have a payment plan provision in place. However, the house bill 
also appropriated $100 million in coronavirus relief funds to provide protection for utility customers that face a financial hardship. And in December, the city of Waynesboro applied for and received about $308,000 in CRF funds. Um, and through our initial uh, late billing notice following um, the, the required standard of, of the code, we've distributed more than $10,000 to eligible utility customers. Uh, in addition, I think it should be noted that the city council uh, last year appropriated $175,000 from the city's original CARES allocation to the Shindoy Department of Social Services to provide utility uh, and rent and mortgage assistance to Waynesboro households facing economic hardship due to the coronavirus pandemic. And through December, more than $115,000 was distributed for households for utilities, and that included electric gas and the city's water and sewer bills, and for rental assistance uh, for past due bills dating back as far as the beginning of the pandemic in March of 2020. And then finally, the city's current CDBG annual action plan calls for the appropriation of approximately $34,000 for basic public assistance for low to moderate income households. So my point being that in addition to having the availability of a payment plan, we have a number of resources that have been made available uh, to assist customers to bring their bills uh, up to date. And in fact, when uh, the, the House Bill 50 five uh, was passed, most of our customers had already come up uh, to, to current because we had monies available to help them. So running the utility disconnections is certainly it's, it's time consuming for the city. It's stressful for both our city staff and certainly for customers. Um, it's not something that uh, we want to do. Unfortunately, disconnections may be the final measure to ensure payment of past due bills. And in the absence of time of payment, then you can have a, a growing uh, past due collection amount, which is uh, undermines our financial stability and as well can create a utility bill uh, for a customer that is growing larger and larger until it's uh, really onerous and difficult uh, to, to bring into uh, uh, currency. We've established multiple resources, as I've just outlined, to assist households who are struggling. And certainly, you know, we would do everything that we could to prevent cutting somebody off if their household is suffering uh, some sort of a, a financial hardship due to the, the virus. And as long as that, that is communicated to us, and if somebody gets their water cut off, and at that point they communicate that they have a hardship, then we work with that customer. But otherwise, it would be, um, you know, I think um, that once you've exhausted those uh, uh, eligibility standards, then we would expect that a customer would pay their bill as they would have prior to the pandemic. So if it is the council's desire uh, to seek relief from the moratorium, you can do so by a verbal resolution. You would simply have to have a motion. Uh, to verify and accept the exceedance as it's been presented to you, uh, that the account arrearages is greater than 1% of the utilities uh, annual revenue budget, uh, and that would effectively uh, provide the city relief from the utility uh, moratorium on disconnection. I'm glad to answer any questions that you might have. I think. Um, uh, both Mr. McCormick and Ms. Michaels have worked hard on this particular issue and they could probably provide some insight as well. Anyone have questions for Mr. McCormick, Mr. Shaw, or Ms. Michaels? Uh, I, I do have a question uh, for whoever wants to take it. Or, uh, some of it is also just a statement. Um, I, I'm glad to hear that we're sort of stressing uh, the options that are available. Uh, particularly to families and, and households that have been distressed by the COVID uh, pandemic, um, because that's what this was about. This was saying, hey, we shouldn't be cutting people off in the midst of a pandemic if they cannot pay a bill because of that situation. Um, but I also understand that with such a large arrearage um, that we need to be able to have the tools to, to help other people get back on, on target with paying their bills as well. 
Um, something that I think would be uh, useful for us to have is get some feedback in a couple of months. And, and again, to, looking back to whoever would be able to collect that data is to say, you know, how have we done in bringing that up to date? How many of the uh, households that were in arrears uh, were COVID related and how has that been funded through these different programs you highlighted? And then also how many households were not uh, found to, to meet the criteria and, uh, and how have we done bringing those up to date and have we had to move on to, uh, to cutoffs? Um, because again, I, I think the, the goal here is to keep things, you know, get things back up to date, but then also use the appropriate funding mechanisms to, to help those households that have been affected. So I don't know who would be collecting that data or when we might be able to see that. We collect that data as we speak that um, because of the, you know, the nature of the funds that we're using, or they all originate from some federal source that we're required to, to track that information. And so, um, you know, I know in the first round, for instance, that um, we, we have two billing cycles a month that we bill half of our customers in one cycle and half in the other. So you bill about 4,500 customers. And in that first billing cycle, when the house bill had taken effect, um, we ended up having to send notices to about 1,100 customers. We had 1,100 customers who were 30 days or more in arrears. And of those 1,100, we had applications from, uh, and in, I should note, that in those notices, we provided information about the availability of these funds and a repayment plan. And so we had about 50 applications uh, from folks who um, you know, met the standard and we provided uh, funds of about $10,000 or so from one of the sources, mostly from the CRF funds. So, um, so that maybe gives you some sense of, of you know, what our first billing cycle experience was, and we will continue to track that. Now, of course, we haven't cut anybody off since the House bill was passed because we haven't seek, you know, sought relief from the moratorium, but we can certainly uh, keep the council apprised as to how the funding was going. Thank you. Anyone, anyone else? Yeah, I, I would also just sort of uh, ask too that if we could you know, share those, share that through our social media presence. Or otherwise, that you know this program is available, and because um, I, I I I hearken back to conversations used to have with Don Coffee about the the uh, personal property tax, you know, the relief um, that uh, that might be available, or the uh, senior citizen tax exemption for for that, and that there there is uh, certainly more eligible uh, portions of our population that could take advantage of those programs, but either that they don't know about it or they're, they, they're afraid to ask that if there was some way that we could intervene, at least uh, do all that we can, you know, even, even every, you know, next couple of every, every other week for the next couple of months, just to let folks know that that's available. Don't wait until it's cut off. Well, to be clear, we're required by law to notify a customer whose bill is late. And right. we, we notify them through an individual notice of the availability of the program. So if you have a if you get a late notice, you're also getting uh, information about these programs. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, with that, we're going to move on to a public hearing. And I just want to announce that this public hearing is to uh, hear from the citizens on uh, Governor, Go Governor Northern's House Bill 5005 Utility Disconnect Mor Moratorium. We're not uh, uh, into the citizen comment period yet, so this is going to be on House Bill 5005 Utility Disconnect Moratorium. On the screen now is the number and the directions on um, calling in. So if you call 844-844. 9200, when prompted, enter the access code 398145, followed by the pound sign. You will hear a Q&A session has started. Hit star six, or press star six. If you would like to be heard or if you'd like to speak, press one, you'll be added in the queue. Once you uh, press one, they'll let you into the room to present to council. With that, I... Uh, Hereby open the public hearing for Governor Northern's 
House Bill 505 Utility Disconnect Moratorium. Mr. Mayor, same um, situation as the last time. There are um, two participants in the waiting room currently, so I'm going to open the question and answer now. And if they would like to speak, they can feel free to follow the prompts. Anyone come in, Mr. McCormick? No, sir. Okay. Actually, hold on. There is one pending question now. So okay. I will start that if that's your pleasure. Yes, sir. Okay. They should be able, you should be able to hear them Thank now. Thank you so much for taking my question. Um, I'm a Waynesboro resident, and I just have a, a few comments I would like to make, and anyone can feel free to respond to them. Um, many people incarcerated middle river, river Hello, jail can you hear me? Uh, offenders. And it seems very likely most can they hear me? I think they've they've been muted, Mr. Mayor. Okay. I don't know if the caller can hear uh, you, but you may want to provide some direction. Okay. Uh if you're if you're still in the waiting room, we are not uh, taking public comment at this time. We are doing a public hearing on Govern, Governor Northern's House Bill 505 Utility Dis Disconnect Moratorium. We will have public public comment period coming here uh, within the next few minutes. But right now, we're not in public comment period. If you're talking and you're in the room and you can hear me, you may want to disconnect, recall the number, and get back into the queue. No one else entered during that time, so I'll go ahead and end the question and answer, and that should put that participant into the back into the waiting room if they'd like to participate again later. Okay. Okay. All right. The, the public hearing is now closed. Uh, is there a motion to uh, enter to relief for Governor Northam's uh, utility disconnect? Did you hear me, Mr. Mayor? I can hear you, Mr. Allen. Thank you. All right. I, I'll open it. I didn't hear you. Did you make a motion or not? Yes, sir. I did make the motion. Okay. Mr. Allen, thank you for the motion. Is there a second to Mr. Allen's motion? A second. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Uh, is there any discussion? Okay. This, is, this requires a vote. So all in favor of... Uh, Extending the city relief to Governor Northam's uh, House Bill 505 utility disconnect moratorium, say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Uh, aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Thank you all. Mr. Mayor? Yes, ma'am? Just to be clear, um, we'd need the motion to, to approve that the exceedance is accurate and that. Um, the council is voting to exempt itself under the one percent provision. All right, so I, I the, the motion needs to be we're exempting ourselves. That you verified that the ex exceedance and the numbers that the staff has provided is accurate. Okay. And that you're going to proceed with the exemption. Okay. Um, is there a motion to? Uh, Verify that the uh, numbers are, are what they are supposed to be. We're in exceedance of 1% of the, our utility budget. I'll make that motion, Mr. Mayor. Okay. And is there a second? I will second. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Uh, any discussion on this? All in favor, say aye and show hands. Aye. aye. Any opposed? Hearing no opposition, this motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Michelson. Uh, the next uh, item number 12 is to hold a public hearing to receive comment on budget ordinance items 13A through J and 14A through K. Mr. McCormick. Thank you and good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of council. 
Agenda item number 12 is to hold a public hearing for various budget ordinances contained in item 13 and 14. Uh, a formal public hearing is necessary anytime the council desires to amend the fiscal year budget by more than 1%. For the fiscal year 2021, that threshold is $1,113,726. And these ordinance combined to almost $3.4 million dollars um the public hearing also requires an advertisement that was done on january 16th in the news virginia um, the new ordinances are broken up into categories of like kind with ordinances that can be introduced and discussed this evening and then would be moved to your consent agenda on the next meeting contained in item 13 and ordinances that can be introduced discussed and adopted this e evening contained in item 14. Um, one of the key points on this is that you can act on each of these items um, in one motion. You, so you can do third, you can open the public hearing, hold the public hearing, and then if the council's wishes, you can do all the items A through J and 13 together as one motion and the same all the items 14 through K together in one motion. Um, and then we discussed the ordinances in more detail during the work session, but if you all or council has any questions um, on any of the individual ones, I'd be happy to answer them now or after the public hearing or during items 13 and 14, whatever your wish would be. Okay. All right. Any questions for Mr. McCormick? All right. So we're going to open the public hearing. For items A through J. and uh the public hearing is going to be open now this is for appropriation ordinance items uh a through j for items 13 and 14 mr mayor oh for uh items 13 and 14 a through j and 14 uh a through k and we can yes. have the same public hearing on both right we're just voting separate yes sir that is correct okay so uh, we're opening the public hearing for our appropriation ordinance. If you're in the waiting room, this is not citizen comment period. This is a public comment period for or a public hearing for our appropriation ordinance. We're not we're not to the citizen comment period of our meeting yet. So if you want to make a comment regarding the appropriation ordinance that's in the packet, uh, please call 844-844-9200. When prompted to ask for the access code, you'll enter 398145, followed by the pound sign. You will hear question and answering has started. Press star six. If you would like to, uh, you will hear if you would like to speak, press one, press one. Uh, while you're in the queue, you'll hear the uh, audio feed of the meeting. Wait until you are prompted by the moderator to share your comments on appropriation ordinance only on appropriation ordinances only so the citizen comment period is now open i mean the public hearing is now open same situation mr mayor there is one participant in the in the waiting room and i've opened the question and answer so if they would like to speak they can come into the public comment section now for the appropriation ordinance yes sir And no one has entered at this time. Okay. So if no one's entered the room, I hereby close the public hearing. And uh, with the public hearing now closed, do we have a motion uh, to receive the, or to accept the budget ordinance amendments uh, 13A through J and 14A, no, 13A through J? Do we have a motion to? Uh, I'll make that motion. Thank you, Mr. Short. I'll second it. Thank you, Dr. Hostetter. Any discussion? All right, this, uh, this ordinance carries over till February the 8th, 2021. The, uh, correct? Yes, sir. That's correct. Okay. Uh, now we're going to, uh, I ask for a motion to accept items 14A uh, through K. Is there a motion to accept items 14A through K. I'll make that motion. Thank you, Mr. Short. Is there a second? I will second that. Thank you, Dr. Hostetter. Any discussion? This motion carries over to our 
Um, this, this one can be adopted, Mr. Mayor, if that's council's wish. Okay, th this one can be adopted, okay. Yes, sir. Uh, we've got a first and a second. Is there a motion to approve this? I mean, all in favor of approving this, say aye and raise your hand. This is aye. 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 Okay, is there uh, nays? Are you opposed? Hearing no opposed, this motion carries 5-0. All right, that brings us down to item number 15, communications, correspondence, and calendars from the city manager. Mr. Mayor, members of council, the only item I have this uh, this evening is a reminder that we have a budget work session this Wednesday at 6 p.m. That will be a Zoom meeting. Okay, so thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll move on to item number 16, which is our citizen comment period. Now, those that are in the waiting room, this is your chance to come in and, and share your thoughts with council. Um, item number 16 is citizen uh, comment period. If you want to participate, call 844-844-9200. When you enter the room, you'll be prompted to enter the uh, meeting code 398145, followed by the pound sign. You will hear question and answer. Press star six. If you would like to speak, press one. You'll be added into the queue. Once you're in the queue, you'll hear an audio feed of the meeting. When it's your turn to speak, uh, the moderator will tell you you can share your thoughts and concerns with city council. Just remember, when you share your thoughts and concerns during the citizen comment period, this is for you to speak to us. We're not going to give you answers. We can't give you answers. So we'll hear your thoughts. If you have concerns that want to, uh, you want to bring out to a council member, you can uh, uh, leave your comment here and let us know, and we'll call you back and talk to you about your concerns. Right, Mr. McCormick. I am going to open the question and answer mode now. And there were three participants in the um, waiting room. So if they would like to enter, they should have the ability to do that now. Okay. If you're wanting to enter, they can press one. Is that right? Are they there? Yes, sir. And we do have, um, it looks like people that wish to speak. So I'm going to hit next question. And they should be able to participate now. Okay, you're you're in the, the council room meeting, so go ahead and uh, tell us your name and your concerns, please. Yes, sir. Um, are you on oh, speakerphone? With I think they might be watching a delayed feed, um, so that you may want to mute your TV or your phone. Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, ma'am. Go ahead and speak. I can't hear you guys unless I have the YouTube thing on. I can't hear you all talking at all. Um, we can hear you. So this is Chanda McGuffin, 644 
My comment was about the Middle River um, expansion at the jail and my concerns about that and, and the money for taxpayers for us to look at building more of the facilities and shuffling more people into the facility instead of having more preventive programming that we can invest the money into. And that was what my concern is, is that we are shifting money into more incarceration instead of prevention. I believe we can spend the money more wisely, the taxpayers' money more wisely in social issues here in the, in the city. It concerns me, too, that it took us almost 20 years before anything was done to our high school. And the, and, the, and the facility of the high school, and the building of the high school, all of that battling back and forth for years with city council members and the community and the school board. And it seems like you all are, you all are, you know, really enticed by making this regional jail larger. And it, it's not logical to have a bed for 350 facilities bed and you have nearly 800 people down there and so now you're saying let's make it larger when it was built for it wasn't even built for how many people is there it wasn't built for the municipalities that are using it and we're ending up getting the brunt end of the expense of the extension i know it's not just waynesboro it's all the municipalities but we need to come together in this region and stop just locking people up. If they're, if they're in Middle River Jail, there are some alternatives that we can do and some changes we can do instead of putting them into the Department of Corrections. We've got to do better. We've got to do better with that and be more community-minded in helping them. He's already said they don't even have psychologists there. They don't have therapists there. So a lot of mental issues, issues a lot of mental issues concerns happening in going to Middle River Jail. And we gotta take that into account. These, these are people, these are human beings, they're not cattle. They are people. And we have to put some humanity in the decisions that we're making through our city council leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McGuffin. I uh, moved on to the next. Hello. Uh, I hope you can hear me because I can't hear you. My name is Mitch Narduzzi, and I actually am a Stanton resident, uh, but I'm calling in uh, because I'm also a consultant in the state of Pennsylvania for uh, Reentry Council Coalition Building. And so I wanted to address the expansion of the Middle River Regional Jail. And hopefully you guys can hear me. I don't know how this works, but let me just go ahead and do it. Um, so mostly architects were, uh, it's a for-profit company that drafted a very community-based corrections plan that the authority board is relied on to justify the expansion. But the whole problem with this is that um, the jail simply is a repos repository for our criminal justice failures as, uh, as a community. And the reason I say this is because if we were simply able to uh, lobby for legislative change or to put pressure on the Department of Corrections to move the 300 plus people that are currently being housed at Middle River Regional Jail, just simply waiting for transportation to other facilities run by the Department of Corrections, that would immediately drop our numbers to a more sustainable and uh, serviceable population at the jail and wouldn't even require the expansion. So. Um, even the criminal justice planner for the Rocking, um, Rockingham Harrisonburg municipality questions whether or not it's a prudent financial investment for them to sink more money into a corrections-based model that simply doesn't work. And that's proven by over 70% recidivism rate at our jail. So we are actually not going to increase um, public safety or serve the population of human beings there that are the majority of them need expensive um, mental health treatment and substance use disorder treatment. Uh, and if, if uh, we need to 
control the current population for another three years until the actual jail is built. I don't understand why we can't put those same measures in place uh, so that we don't need the expansion at all. So if we're repeating this model that will ensure that if we build it, our current criminal justice system will fill it. So while this is not uniquely, um, not a unique problem specific to our area, this happens across the country, there is data out there and model evidence-based models that show that we can do our whole criminal justice system differently. Our Commonwealth Attorney's Office don't believe that um, we should expand the jail. They want to see uh, pretrial diversion programs and alternatives to incarceration. And I hope you consider that before you um, commit any more money to a system that is inevitably uh, just going to repeat the harm that it, it does now. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Hello? Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Anyway, my name's uh, Andrea Jackson, and I, I prefer not to so, uh, give the address. I live in Ward A because there are some crazy adjusted tapes you get. Yeah. And so, uh, um, I'd like to say. One is that this meeting was entirely too long. It's ridiculous. It seems that every time there's an important issue that, that demands, you know what I mean, the citizens to comment on it, y'all overload the meeting and has it up to like nine o'clock. Like y'all have like five public hearings. This is ridiculous. Y'all have two meetings a month. I don't understand how y'all didn't spread this out or, you know what I mean, work job schedule, you know what I mean, to like make this more balanced. And then also, I have an issue, you know what I mean, with y'all not being able to have your meetings uh, in live and in public. I know that it's COVID, you know what I mean? I get that. You know what I mean? When kids have to go to school, when everybody else goes to work, I don't understand why y'all can't, you know what I mean, uh, meet in person. And I understand that maybe the facility at the uh, the city council is not appropriate, but like the school board, you can have it in the high school auditorium where people can spread out, where y'all can spread out on the stage, and people, you know, you can get their opinions heard. You know what I mean? And then you might have to see, you know, hey, you know what I mean? These people have come out and they want, you know what I mean, their voice to be heard. You know what I mean? I think that this is a tactic that y'all use because y'all don't want people, you know, to confront y'all about issues that is uncomfortable. And so then when it comes to uh, Little River Jail, you know what I mean? Like, I think, you know, y'all think y'all are being split and y'all going to go ahead and uh, approve this behind people's back. I don't understand how y'all are going to approve this and borrow this money and not have a public hearing on it before February the 2nd, first of all. And then I just don't understand this. Like uh, other people have said before, is that first the no, what I'm going to say is, is that the superintendent of the uh, Middle River Jail did not do a good job in presenting his case. And when y'all did ask questions, he did not answer. Because he knew that uh, the answers was is that the people who are in Middle River Jail, half of them are, you know, that's not their first intent. This is all like, it's like they, like, um, didn't pay their fines or like their, uh, uh, their, it's like on their probation. You know what I'm saying? These people are locked into the system. And so therefore they keep feeding into the system. He doesn't want to tell y'all that. You know what I mean? Because he wants to uh, grow the uh, jail. Because people have to pay because this is about money. And I don't understand how, first of all, Wasteful doesn't have a lot of money. So how are y'all going to borrow money, sink into a jail, but y'all can't spend money on the youth or anything productive to make the town better? And so I think, you know, what you should do is, you know what I mean, take a step back and really, you know, 
look at, you know, this situation, how, what, really get some answers. Because the superintendent did not give y'all any answers. And my camp needs to go back and get the answers. He shouldn't just be co-signed on this just because he's on the advisory board. And y'all should be, be voting on it because he's good in the okay. Y'all need to do some research and really figure out what is the best thing for the community. Because, you know what I mean, like, mental health is an issue. But what they're doing is, you know, put mental health ward on there. The man says they don't even have a full-time psychiatrist, and he's not even interested in the people uh, hiring a full-time psychiatrist, or, you know, he's really about the people's mental illness or mental health. He just wants the biz up there so he can get more people up there so they can get more money. And so y'all really need to, uh, to evaluate this. And I don't want, you know, to be, this to be some underhanded thing that y'all, like, sneak off behind closed doors and approve of. Y'all need to have a public hearing about this. You know, we can say, if y'all will borrow millions of dollars about this, we need to have a public hearing about it, about what's going on. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Um, yes, my name is Sharon Fitz, and I am a resident of Waynesboro. I'm not sure if you all can hear me because there's no way for me to know. But I do want to say, um, start off by saying incarceration is not rehabilitation. And it seems to me that there is a, you know, a focus of expanding a, a Middle River jail when clearly incarceration is not working. If the numbers are increasing, then it seems to me that you all need to consider a different avenue to address the needs of the people who keep rotating through those doors. Um, you know, there's, when I'm listening, I hear you all talking, and I don't hear any humanity within you, in your voices. It's as if you're focused only on the numbers and the dollars, but not the people. And uh, there are a lot of ways that you can use that money to address the need for preventive services as opposed to continuing to pay um, to incarcerate people. So I, I just that's really what I want to make sure. I hope I can be heard because I, there's no way for me to know. Mike, did she say her name was Miss Fitz? Yeah. Thank you, Miss Fitz. That was the last caller in the Q&A, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, sir. All right, so citizen comment period. session is over. Citizen comment period is over. We're going to move to item number 17, which is a closed session. The city manager has requested a closed session. Is there a motion to bring uh, a Mr. Mayor, I move this uh, meeting to be recessed and that the city council of Waynesboro immediately reconvene in a closed meeting for the following purposes to discuss the award of public contract involving the expenditure of public funds, including the discussion of terms or scope of such contract where discussion in an open session would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the city as authorized by section 2.2-3711A29 of the state code. The sub subject matter of the meeting is the lad property development. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second it. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Is there any discussion? I think this requ requires a roll call vote. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ms. Bortles, can you do a roll call vote? Mr. Mayor, let me help you with that. Okay. Mr. Allen? Aye. Uh, Mr. Henderson? Aye. Mr. Hoss, Dr. Hostetter? Aye. Mr. Short? Aye. Mrs. Williams? Aye. The meeting is officially moved to closed session.
the third. Yeah. Yes. I'm sorry. What, what was Miss What was Miss Michelson saying? The certification. Um, I have it as a. Yeah. Where, whereas the uh, we convened the closed session. Yeah, it's a certification. Okay, it says resolution <laughs> certification. So, Mr. Mayor, as well, when, after you conclude that and certify the content of the closed session, but before you adjourn, if you could pause and then let me um, conclude follow, a follow up matter with citizen comment period. Okay. Yep. We're live again, by the way. Very good. Um, ready? Mr. Mayor, I move to adopt the following consideration, whereas the City Council of Waynesboro has convened a closed meeting on this date pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, and whereas Section 2.2-3712 of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by the City Council that such a closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the City Council of Waynesboro hereby certifies to the best of each member's knowledge um, only public business matters lawfully exempted from the open meeting requirements by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which this certification resolution applies and only such business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered by the City Council of Waynesboro. Is there a motion that we turn to open session and clarify the closed meeting, our uh, closed session? I'll make that motion. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Shaw, can you give us a roll call vote? Sure, I can. Mr. Allen? Aye. Uh, Mr. Henderson? Aye. Dr. Hostetter? Aye. Uh, Mr. Short? Aye. And Mrs. Williams? Aye. We're back in open session. The session's back open. Uh, Mr. Hamp, did you have some closing statements you wanted to make? Well, yes, sir. Um, items related to citizen comment period. In this virtual environment, we're advised by Ms. Michelson that we need to acknowledge um, um, citizens are able to submit in writing public comment period, and Ms. Michelson advises that it's important for the council to acknowledge those written comments that we've received and note that they will be included in the record of the meeting. So in a summary fashion, um, Ms. Kathleen Temple um, has submitted uh, comments relating or sharing the opposition to jail expansion. Um, Ms. Linda Meyer, actually Dr. Linda Meyer, uh, has shared comments opposing jail expansion. Um, Mr. Peter Van Acker uh, has submitted comments, I think, encouraging thoughtful examination and consideration of jail expansion. Um, Ms. Mary Sullivan opposes um, jail expansion and supports prevention programs. Um, Mr. Tom McDonald has submitted comments related to membership on the Cultural Commission. And finally, um, Ms. Natalie Stickle, um, opposes jail expansion and those those communications are available in their entirety um, in the clerk's office and will be included in the record of the meeting thank you sir um mr hamp I'd like, I, and i apologize i meant to add those at the end because i've got a list here also uh, i want to include miss jennifer lewis opposes the uh, jail expansion arlene jackson dig opposes the jail expansion and ray lynn kasdan closes the jail expansion. So th thank you, Ms. Michelson and Mr. Hamp for bringing that to my attention. So with, with that, is there a motion to adjourn this meeting? I'd like to make that motion. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Is there a second? Second. I would second it. I thank you, Mr. Short. Uh, any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? This meeting's adjourned. Thank you. Motion carries 5-0.